I see now that it's it's five to two, so maybe it's uh, useful for us to begin. And as usual, as I say, hi folks, lots to discuss. For our top news, our rapid climate response from science is essential. In technology, don't ignore the possibility that AI is becoming conscious. Wow. On agriculture, the world spends $1.8 trillion a year on subsidies that harm the environment. In materials, triggering room temperature superconductivity with a flash of light. In space and astronomy, there is an Earth-like planet spotted orbiting sun's closest star. On to biology. Here are five top tips to consider before getting a canine companion. I think we just decided we wouldn't because we thought when we die, it would be uh, feeling lonely. That's the first of the thing on the list. Um, for us, a lifetime of knowledge, it says, can clutter memories of older people. Nah. In, in health and medicine, moderate calorie restriction rewires our metabolism and immunity for a longer health span. So that's what we'll discuss today. And Richard, what's this in our top story that a rapid climate response from science is absolutely essential. Now, the uh, this is really about one organization in the UK, and uh, it starts talking uh, from the basis of one of the people involved with the organization in the UK, and she says, "My colleagues says." I, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine have shown what can be done in the case of a deadly global threat. And she says environmental scientists now must do the same in the face of an even bigger threat than COVID-19, which is climate change and biodiversity loss. And she says the millions who have tragically died in the pandemic will be followed by many more if we don't take urgent action over these twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. And our response needs to be much more ambitious and rapid. And so uh, they have in the UK started a project, which is a rapid research project that is named the Agile Initiative, and it's being launched at Oxford with 10 million pounds of official backing. And this is a recognition that science can and must act now. And they say we do not have time for the usual slow drawn out environmental research uh, the time is past for that and what they are trying to do is to deliver demand-led solutions through what they call sprints and the sprints are individual targeted programs which are trying to have effect in the near term, not in the long term, and they've already started. And with these programs, speed of delivery is important, but also important is working closely with the community, with those who need the effects of the work and those who have the expertise to share. And so with the sprints, they try to tackle how to best scale up 
nature-based solutions. And uh, one of the things they're doing uh, is working together with farmers and local communities and businesses. Here, the president of the National Farmers Union says the NFU has particular interest in understanding how nature-based solutions can work better alongside food production so that we can strike the right balance to understand the trade-offs but also maximize the opportunities. Now they stress that being agile does not mean cutting corners, but means acting quickly and using new cutting edge scientific research and working at a pace that is not usually seen or even attempted in these uh, scientific investigations. And they are working in a number of areas. They include how to reduce waste, transition to green fuels, scale up nature-based solutions, figure out more greenhouse gas removal solutions, and protect biodiversity, jobs, and human well-being. And they say, we need this right now because all around the world, governments and companies and people are making plans for dealing with climate change and achieving net zero. And without the science underpinning these pledges, then they're not going to be effective. So... For me, I say here, here for what they're doing in the UK, and I think this particular kind of effort is one that should be uh, imitated in other places around the world, say uh, the US and Canada. So what do you think? Well, I'd like to say something here. Yes, sir. The, the idea that there is a consensus on CO2 causing climate change, there may be a consensus in the environmental community, but there certainly isn't in the science community. And anybody who has a science training or experience uh, resists this, particularly geologists. And I don't know a single geologist who subscribes to this climate change caused by CO2 uh, idea. They all believe that climate change is normal and it's caused by solar variation in the output of the sun and in the orbit of the earth around the sun. And this, if, if we really wanna see some misguided application of resources, all we gotta do is look at the way the uh, climate change hysteria has diverted uh, hundreds of billions of dollars away from where it's needed in helping the uh, third world get ahead. Everyone knows the IPCC is a political body, not a scientific body, and they manipulate their data to get the answers they want. I guess they manipulated it with Venus too. Uh, Venus is a different uh, thing. It's a lot closer to the sun, and there's all kinds of differences. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, but there's uh, one of the differences is the CO2 in their atmosphere is a lot higher than it is on Earth, and it hasn't worked out well for them. Well, the geological record shows that the CO2 levels on the Earth have been 10 times what they currently are, and temperatures were five or 10 degrees higher. We know that the last, there've been six ice ages and they all started when uh, CO2 levels were higher than they are now. So the idea that CO2 causes global warming is uh, nonsense. I'm afraid there are many people who would not agree with you and I'm one, but thank you for your input. Shall we go to the next person?
for your input, Andrew. That's a very intelligent thing you've said. Thank you. I, I, I'm, no I, I, I'm interested in this. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have seen Contact. Do you remember the Jodie Foster film based on Carl Sagan's stuff? And, um, and when she was applying for the job to go out and do all these things in, uh, in, in space, they said, if you come across another being, what would be the first question you would ask them? And she thought, she said, the first question I would ask them is, how did you do it? Meaning you have a complex society and in this complex society, how did you prevent nuclear disaster? How did you prevent climate change? How did you prevent the loss of biodiversity? And I don't know what kind of answer would be there, but the question is for the future, how can we do it? What, what is possible for us to survive? And we'll get into questions about that. Anyway, on to somebody else. Okay, I was uh, <laughs> stating that I agree that uh, ice ages will come and go. There's no question that uh, solar activity, our proximity to the sun and so forth will have an effect on our temperature worldwide. The question is, what effect do, do, does mankind have on the weather, on the global changes in temperature and climate and, and so forth? If it's an undesirable change, is there something we should be doing to reduce the amount of change? Does that make sense? Sure. It sure does. I think uh, global warming is is a, a fact. And uh, since the industrial revolution that's gone up just tremendously from, I don't know, 400 or from 200 to 450. And uh, I, I don't think there's, well, they always quote is saying that 97% uh, of climate scientists uh, agree with that it is man caused and it's a coming disaster. And I believe in the science. There's another reason that why science should be taken seriously. They have dug down the ice in Iceland, kilometers down, and they can actually see the climate, how it has changed up and down over hundreds and thousands of years. They have looked at those curves and said, this is what we would expect. This is the effect of, you know, they have analyzed it scientifically. That's why a vast majority are in agreement that uh, climate change is here and is a serious threat to us. Well, what, what's the issue between what Andrew said about geologists and what the climate science are saying? Why should there be a discrepancy? Well, it's, it's clear that there will be things as Andrew described, another ice age. And after that, it'll be a period of warming and then it'll be another ice age. There, there will be inevitably changes in our climate. But as I, I said before, the question is, what effect does mankind have on the climate? And if it's uh, a bad effect, how can we mitigate it? Right. How can we reduce the change? And certainly there's evidence that in the last 200 years, there has been uh, an increase in the temperature on the planet that is seems to be associated with the increased uh, level of CO2. Uh, and there's some evidence of more erratic extreme weather that seems to have happened like this year in places like Canada. And so we're seeing something happen and it's not because of changes in the uh, sun 
uh, situation and we're seeing these changes happen in places like the Arctic and Antarctic. So something is happening. And again, it's not because the sun is generating more energy and the earth is getting hotter. Well, Richard, there are two things here. One is having reached a certain temperature and it stays at that temperature, you have one situation. But another situation is that there is change. And if the temperature worldwide is increasing very rapidly over a period of a year or two, well, that's a different matter that may cause storms and, and so forth. So there are two issues there. One is, you know, if we ever reach a stable temperature, and the other is the change, the transition, mm -hmm. because transition can be very painful, we know. I was, so Richard, if we want to move on, what's this about MIT researching saying that uh, maybe AI might be conscious? Well, this has been one of the kind of things that I've been looking for. Uh, you know, I have been talking uh, for some time about what uh, they are calling the singularity, meaning that time when our computers are smarter than we are. And that in terms of being smart, there are multiple issues and one of the things that they are uh, concerned with is consciousness. Now, of course, the problem they have with consciousness and dealing with it is that the scientists still don't know what consciousness is, so it's a little hard to tell. And so anyway, this started with uh, one scientist who was the head scientist of uh, Open AI, which was a group that was started by, founded by Elon Musk. And he tweeted uh, in early February that, quote, it may be that today's large neural networks are slightly conscious. Now, I don't know what, since they don't know what conscious is, then I'm not sure if they know what slightly conscious is either. But when he said it, then immediately there was an uproar from most of the other people doing AI research uh, who were saying that this claim was harming machine learning's reputation and amounted to a little bit more than a sales pitch for OpenAI's work. Uh, then another computer scientist uh, then bucked the trend and came to the defense of this guy and said, quote, seeing so many prominent machine learning folks ridiculing this idea is disappointing disappointing. It makes me less hopeful in the field's ability to seriously take on some of the profound and important questions that they will undoubtedly be faced over the next few decades. I don't think we can draw a clear line between models that are not conscious versus maybe slightly conscious. I'm not sure that any of these models are conscious, but I do think that the question should be a meaningful one and it just shouldn't be neglected. And the researchers to all of this respond that it's just a concept and that it's too far in the future to worry about yet. And some of the people are worried, a few of the people are worried, and they're being ridiculed by the other scientists because of their worry. But we all can find cases where the scientists who were ridiculed turned out to be correct when you look at them later.
And I'm wondering if this is one of these cases, if AI is going to become conscious and if we will ever figure out what consciousness is to begin with. So there are a few issues that are wrapped up in here, all of which are puzzling to me. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, I have one of those things on my desk here and uh, it only responds to my voice, nobody else's. Uh, it's kind of makes you think that this thing has, has brains. And uh, you know, if you would like, I can ask it and see if, if, if they have some something on consciousness. Would you like me to do that? Sure, ask Alexa, what is consciousness? Hey Google. What is consciousness? According to Wikipedia, consciousness at its simplest sentient awareness of it. It just gives a one word answer and it's very soft for some reason. Hey Google, what is consciousness? According to Wikipedia, consciousness at its simplest is sentient for awareness of internal and external existence. Despite millennia of analyses, definitions, explanations, and debates, can you hear that? Yes, kind of. <laughs> it is for some reason not a very soft. It is usually, uh, hey Google, can you talk a little louder? <laughs> okay, I think. <laughs> Richard, Richard, in what way would it make a difference? whether AI, be AI was conscious or not? I don't know. What difference does it make that you're conscious or not? I think part of it, in my own mind, there, if uh, the systems are uh, conscious, there's the, I think, at least implication that they will be able to start to act in a way for their own benefit instead of the benefit for uh, human beings. If your AI system is conscious, conscious, it might not like being turned off, for example. And if you went to go push the off button on your computer, it might send you an electric shock because it doesn't want to die. If I have to to that, that awareness, is it's self awareness that is a measure of consciousness. And right, when you look at say a porpoise, a porpoise is self conscious, it sees its reflection in an aquarium, and this is considered the measure of, of being conscious. You're self aware, and as you just suggested, if you're self aware, you may want to protect yourself from being eliminated by throwing the power switch, right. I have a comment, Richard, and that is there's so many different kinds of intelligence. We're talking about artificial intelligence, but even, even among humans, there's people who are very intelligent in one area and dumb is in another area. So you would have to feed all these different kinds of intelligence into the artificial intel intelligence to think that it would threaten us. And you still don't know if feeding the artificial intelligence, all the kind of intelligence that we can feed it, if it's going to make it conscious, conscious uh, rather than just being a great bit cruncher. The bit cruncher doesn't know what it's doing. Uh, uh, a conscious computer would be aware of itself even if there weren't any bits. One interesting thing about uh, these uh, Siri and uh, Google, whatever it is, who answers your question, is that the questions all go into a huge database and are matched up with other standard uh, similar questions. And then they have a standard answer that's provided. It's not like the uh, system actively analyzes your specific question and provides a custom answer to your question. Right. It's just it's just a standard answer that they have done the best they could to match up to the common questions that they get. 
And you're right, Andrew, and that has uh, one component of that is the aggregating of the questions in the range of questions into one question, even before they can give you the answer. Well, I must say that, uh, that this thing that I have on my desk, this acts as if it's a real person. I mean, like, like this morning, I was late coming to this meeting because I had to take my dog to the vet. That's because I asked Google first, what happens when a dog is thrown up and eating grass? And she came up with a, a pretty comprehensive answer. But I didn't quite get everything. And so I repeated the question slightly different. And she came back with, you know, with just a very concise uh, answer anyway. It made me decide to go to the veterinarian and have things taken care of. So uh, it is more than just a, a bunch of standard questions. It really, it really answers your questions, you know. Specific you, questions. I'll, I'll demonstrate it to you. <laughs> now, also, interestingly enough, one of the things that the uh, scientists have found there have investigated these kind of voice assistants and older people and uh, people start to feel a relationship with their uh, computer system a little bit like John is talking about here. He's talking about his Google Assistant as his almost his uh, electronic friend. Well, it's, it's, it's eerie at times. Like I'm yes. excited. Yes. Um, Richard, I can explain that. When I ask Siri, I say, Siri, how old am I? She says, you're 82 but you don't look a day over 30. That's <laughs> why <I'm not. laughs> uh, you must have paid extra for that one. <laughs> so Richard, if we've had our laugh, how about the fact that the world is spending $1.8 trillion a year on subsidies, subsidies that harm the environment? Tell us about it. Well, oops. It turns out that is about 2% of the world's uh, annual gross product. So it's a fairly significant amount of money. And uh, these are uh, subsidies that actually are driving the annihilation of wildlife and uh, a rise in global heating, if you believe that stuff about CO2 in the atmosphere and stuff. And uh, these include things like tax breaks for beef production in the Amazon, so we can tear some more of the Amazon down, and financial support for unsustainable groundwater pumping, for example, in the Middle East. So it shows up in a lot of different places. And uh, this is directly working against the goals of the Paris Agreement and is effectively we're financing with government money, water pollution, uh, the land uh, going underneath the water, and deforestation. And uh, when they look at what they're what we're spending on, they're saying a significant portion of that 1.8 trillion could be repurposed to support policies that are beneficial for nature and a transition to net zero. And they're saying nature is declining at an alarming rate. And we have never lived on a planet with so little biodiversity, which sounds like a pretty significant statement to me. And if you look at these subsidies, uh, more than 600 billion are for fossil fuel subsidies. The agriculture sector gets more than 500 billion uh, water gets 300 billion 
and forestry gets 150 billion and uh, largely these are money that could be directed towards uh, improving the situation instead of making it worse. They also say reform of these subsidies would allow us to improve what they call the price signals, the relative cost of things, so that we're not protecting income in more polluting industries, and it creates space for alternative and cleaner forms of energy to enter the marketplace. The problem with uh, reducing these subsidies, of course, is that many businesses around the world are benefiting from this $1.8 trillion of spending. And uh, as an example of the problem, last year, a UN report found that 90% of the subsidies given to farmers that is 90% of the $500 billion given to farm subsidies are harmful, damaging people's health, fueling the climate crisis, destroying nature, and driving inequality by excluding smallholder farms. And so this is significant money that governments around the world continue to spend every year. And uh, it seems like they could be spent in areas that do us more good than the spending they're doing now. Any thoughts? Well, what comes to mind immediately, say, is almonds in California. It takes a gallon of water to produce one almond. Yet the price that the almond growers pay for water is less than what the citizens pay in their homes for water. Yes. So this is a subsidy. Absolutely. We should be prepared to pay a little bit more for almonds, and the farmers should pay the full price for water and hopefully use less. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another example is growing alfalfa. We lost you. Another example is growing alfalfa in the desert. Yes. Not very environmentally friendly. But there's lots of sun. <laughs> I am. Um, the water table's going down, down, down. And the that's whole true. Of the southwest of the United States is drying up. Yes. <laughs> And the water tables are going down, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world. Where I was in India, the water table in the last 50 years had dropped from 20 feet to 300 feet because of the uh, farmers uh, tapping the uh, electricity poles, stealing electricity, driving their pump to get the water to grow rice. You know, I was wondering about that iceberg that broke loose from uh, the South Pole and brought some hundreds of trillions of waters, uh, fr fresh water to add to the oceans. Is that not going to make a difference? Well, it's not going to help the fresh water because they would have to ship the iceberg over to India and let it melt. Well. Richard, what's this about being able to get superconductivity at room temperature with a flash of light? This uh, could be interesting. Uh, they have been working on uh, superconductivity uh, for the last 30 years. And if the, this is one of the things where there is a profound payoff if they're able to do it. And uh, much of the electricity on the planet is wasted 
it's dissipated by uh, losses in uh, transmission. It's also uh, turns into heat that are problems in pretty much everything that uses electricity and the heat that is generated by the power dissipation heat kills and we see this in uh, technology around the world so it's a big kind of issue and uh, here researchers have they can learn more about a system by giving it some kind of jolt that uh, breaks it out of equilibrium. And they have been using this to, uh, with a material yttrium barium copper oxide or YBCO, which is an interesting material. And uh, they have shown with this material that if you are able to knock it out of its equilibrium with a laser pump or with a magnet, it allows it to be a superconductor at much closer to room temperature than any of the researchers expected. And uh, this gives them the idea that there's a possibility also that other material could be nudged into this superconducting state by applying some kind of energy and particularly the idea of hitting it with a laser light to make it a superconductor is pretty appealing and so uh, what they have found with this material YBCO is it switches from a normal material to a superconductor already they know when it's chilled at a, below a certain transition temperature and at that point the electrons pair up and form a condensate kind of an electron soup that becomes a superconductor and they were able then to repeat this uh, superconductor in the material either by hitting it with a magnet or hitting it with the laser and what they found this particular material is an interesting material at its normal state it has uh, different kinds of uh, functions within its material that are kind of uh, randomly organized and when you hit it with the laser it becomes differently organized and somehow magically it becomes a superconductor and uh, these experiments showed that exposing the samples to magnetism or light generated similar patterns in what are called the charge density waves that are very much associated with superconductivity and so they now are starting to investigate this use of laser light and it they think that laser lights could be a good way to uh, create these transient states that could be stabilized for practical application including room temperature superconductivity and to me it is fascinating that uh, you know here the basic idea is you have some material and you're able to put some energy into the material and 
it changes the energy and the material destabilizes it and changes it into a state where it becomes a superconductor and it seems like this discovery is one of the kind of things that i expect to hear more about as we're going on these meetings in the next couple of years and at the end of it may be room temperature superconductors any thoughts this is very timely because as we switch from generating electricity from fossil fuels to using uh, wind turbines and solar panels, the sources of electricity are moving. So we need a, a new distribution system for electricity. And obviously, superconductors is a much better way to do it. Yes. The other place where superconductors uh, already are uh, showing utility is in the uh, superconducting magnets that they are using to uh, make the next generation of fusion power tokamaks work. Well, Richard, what's this? Um, in space about a planet that looks a lot like our Earth that's orbiting around the sun's closest star. Well, uh, as, as a uh, sci-fi reader since I was 10 years old, to me, this is exciting news. And, you know, one of the things that astronomers are very much better at now is observing uh, the wobbles that happen in stars that reveal planets that are around that star. And here Proxima Centauri is the name of the star. In case you don't know the name of our nearest neighbor, it is only four light years away. How many miles is a light year anyway? Someone, does anyone have the number off the top of their head? It's a long way. And uh, this particular planet, they said, could have oceans of liquid water. And this discovery is showing that Proxima Centauri <coughs> probably has a very rich planetary system. And what they have discovered so far is three small planets uh, around the star. This one, it's smaller than the Earth, but no less than 26% of the Earth's mass. So it's smaller than the Earth, but not tiny. And, uh, this is discovered with a new instrument uh, is called Expresso that was built mainly to search for extrasolar planets and it's finding them already and the scientists are competing for space on this equipment because they want to find some new planets too. And uh, Proxima Centauri has always had a special place in the astronomer's heart because uh, it's the closest one to the Earth. And it's fascinating to know that our sun's nearest stellar neighbor is the host of three small planets, one of which could have oceans. And it's implied if there is liquid water, it may be habitable. So maybe there's a place for Elon Musk to take all his spaceships full of people besides Mars. And uh, this proximity makes the planet a prime system for further study to understand more about it. And even though interstellar travel is still in the realm of science fiction, uh, the the, has, the dream has been there for a long time of going to another star. And I think finding these kind of planets around our closest neighbor uh, will motivate that dream. And I would not be surprised to start hearing about ideas for 
uh, missions to the star to explore it. Who wants to go? I'm not sure how long the trip would take, but any thoughts? I was I was muted, but at uh, speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. Right, I know so, that, but what's that in a year? Well, <laughs> times of by <laughs> right. Get I your calculator. That recently. Okay, I just thought it would take a long time. I just thought some geeky person like me or you would just know it off the top of their head. You could, you could just ask Siri, she'll tell you. Yeah. Well, I think I think Proxima Centauri is about 24 trillion 690 billion miles away. Okay. For an approximation, okay. <laughs> For an approximation. Okay. And, you know, with with the speed of light at 186,000 miles a second, um, it would take four years if we traveled at the speed of light. And which we can't. Which we, uh, we're not even close. Uh, I mean, traveling the speed of light would get you to the moon in one and a half seconds. So as we know, we can get to the moon in three days. Uh huh. But uh, not one and a half seconds. So it's going to be a while before we can even think of traveling to Proxima Centauri. I've got a lot. I think I would send a robot ship first instead of trying to find people who would live long enough to make True. the trip. True. And if, we it's, there, if we went there, what do you think we'd find? I don't know. A planet with water in the Goldilocks zone? You know, maybe we'd find the people that you were talking about who knew how to do it. Right. The one problem, one problem with uh, Proxima Centauri, though, it's known as a flare star. And uh, a, flare, oops. <laughs> a flare star is uh, very uh, unpredictable it, it, with its brightness and x-rays. So it's not like our sun, which is very predictable. Um, so one day you might be uh, on the beach, and the next day you'll be on the beach burnt. <laughs> to okay, okay. So you're saying it's not going to be a good home. We could maybe make a base there and use it to explore other stuff. Yeah, I think they've already found other uh, candidates much better. They're further away. You know, we're talking about our closest star right now, but there's better candidates. Uh, further away and if uh -huh. we can if we can eventually travel the speed of light further away isn't that big a deal uh-huh as long as especially we have uh one of the things they've had in sci-fi forever is the idea of you go in there and you're put in suspended uh animation and then they wake you up when you get to your destination uh, that is true because some of these candidates are at stars, you know, 4,000 light years away. So that means even if we could travel the speed of light, it takes 4,000 years to get there. And it would take another 4,000 years for them to send the signal back that told us we got they got there. That's right. We got there and it's good or it's bad. <laughs> That's right. Well, there's another factor and that is as we approach the speed of light, we age different than people on Earth. Right, time slows down. True. Well, therefore, we'd still be young, is that it? Yeah. Could be. <laughs> and <laughs> one of the things they theorized, does that mean that if you can go faster than the speed of light, does time go backwards? I think you also turn green, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Richard, if we can't find a good home out there, how about providing a good home for your dog? What are the things you have to consider about getting a dog? Well, during the pa during the pandemic, uh, dog ownership actually has increased. Uh, there's been a huge increase. And I guess if you can't see your friends, you can see your dog. And... Uh, Maybe you're thinking about getting a dog. Uh, certainly Fred and Mardell were thinking about a dog. I know Carol and I have also thought about a dog. And now they're saying living with a, 
dog has many positive health benefits, including a lower risk of heart disease and lower stress. And, of course, as anyone who has had a dog will tell you, they provide companionship. And the thing about dogs is there are some factors that uh, need to be considered before uh, you do it. The first on the list is it's a long commitment. And I think that's something that Fred had some concern with. Dogs live for 10 or 15 years. Uh, and You don't think I will, eh? <laughs> well, uh, do you think you will? I think you're going to be immortal because of all of these things you're taking, Fred. But uh, then dogs, of course, will change your life completely and your even normal day-to-day -day activities become more complicated. Dogs also uh, don't just eat dog chow. They eat uh, many, 50 or $100 a month typically to support the dog considering medical expenses and stuff like that. So first, dogs are a long commitment and not a small commitment. Dogs also need company. They need a lot of exercise and play to stay healthy, generally at least two hours a day uh, walking and playing with your dog. And dogs need company. They're social animals and really don't do well with being left alone for more than a few hours a day. I don't think that's as much of a problem with people who have a dog because they're isolated because of the coronavirus, though. They'll be around to give the dog company. The next issue is socialization and training needs. Dogs can have behavioral problems later on uh, in the owner-dog relationships, and it can start at a young age without training. Dogs need to be socialized, and if you have a puppy, you'll need to train them. And dogs don't become fully trained until after puberty, so typically you'd have to invest in training for at least a full year. So you have to train the dog. Now the next issue I think is a little more subtle and this is that personality matters. Dog owners are more satisfied when they perceive the dogs and pets as exhibiting a level of warmth and interaction that was similar to their own. And characteristics that have shown to be important in dog-human matches are a tendency to share possessions, a love of running outside, that would be good for Fred, I know, and the ability to get along with others. Then the other thing to consider with a dog is pedigree or rescue. And every dog is unique, but breeds are factors to consider. Some breeds, for example, require three or four hours of activity every day to keep them healthy. So I think for people like us, those are not a good choice. Uh, and these hereditary traits in dogs cannot be erased. They're there and they will be there pretty much uh, through their lifetime. So if you're thinking about dogs, especially with pedigrees, then breeds become important and you have to think about it. You also have to think about the place where you're getting the dog. And these dog mills and puppy mills are not good places. The dogs from them tend to be poorly behaved and have more problems. The best approach often is a rescue dog and they're already developed and they uh, if the rescue place is a good place they assess them behaviorally and it'll give you the best options for a good match but uh, 
Fred, are you listening? There are other options to full on dog ownership, including volunteering at a shelter, of course, because then you can get the dog companionship you need. Another thing they suggested that I hadn't thought about is asking a neighbor if they need some help with their dog for a few hours a week. So one option if you want a dog is to borrow it from your neighbors. Then you could have the benefits of the canine company, but on a part-time basis. So, do you want a dog? Any thoughts? Well, I got to it. In Japan, you can rent a dog <laughs> for that purpose, to have a dog companion for a few hours every week. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but then in Japan, they have cat cafes and um oh gosh now i'm blanking out <laughs> um, yes and there were other animals i'll have to think about it anyway i've, I've heard about uh food. the equivalent of the cat cafe dog cafes at uh colleges and universities because it turns out uh, there are a lot of kids in that situation that are under stress and being able to go someplace and uh, just have some dog companionship will do you more good than uh, going out and having a beer with your friend. <laughs> Great idea. Yep. Yep. Hospitals have found that dogs are also good. They improve the health of the patients. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. some nursing homes have have a pet that goes around to to uh, residents' rooms. Yes. And one problem with uh, bird species reduction and extinction is feral cats. And if you can get a dog that you can turn loose that will hunt down cats, that might be a good thing for the birds. <laughs> Actually, Andrew, probably COVID is better. Probably COVID's better for the birds than worrying about the cat population. Habitat destruction is is really what's killing off the songbirds. And who's destroying habitat? Yeah. <laughs> we are. Richard, I sometimes wonder whether having all of these ideas in hot science is good for us. And apparently in the next story, it says it can clutter up your brains. What's that all about? Rubbish. Well, I'm glad that there is some uh, scientific reason for uh, the uh, problem that I have seen in myself and with other people I know in terms of retrieving memory. And here I just thought it's because we were old, and it turns out that they have found that it is all this valuable stuff that we uh, keep in our head. Uh, you know, when you try to access a memory, the brain sifts through everything that's stored in it to find relative, uh, the relevant information. But this is a problem when we get old. And researchers now propose an explanation they say that the brains of older adults allocate more space to this accumulated knowledge, and so they have more material to navigate to be able to bring that uh, memory forward. And what they've also found is while this wealth of knowledge can make memory retrieving a problem, that it also has its upside. And uh, one of them is these life experiences actually are an aid in creativity. And there are ways in which us old folks have creative advantages over those kids because of all of this junk in our head. It also turns out that it gives us an advantage in decision making. So it may be slower to get your memory because you have so many more of these wonderful memories, but the advantage of it 
is that you can use these memories and become more creative at this time in your life and you can use it to make better decisions. So I guess let's hear it for being old. But there's also a study that says that to delay dementia, keep your mind active, engage in all kinds of things. So uh, that's what we're doing here, of course. Exactly. This is our dementia, dementia prevention hour. What we need is we need something to defrag our brains. That's what we need. <laughs> the problem that we have to address is somehow learning to um, one give ourselves permission to forget the unimportant stuff and uh -huh. help us figure out what is unimportant and what. And you know, and it's sort of like if you envision the computer in the way you clean off your disk, you know, you search, probably, you search for certain things and then you uh, hit the delete key after you. But it's really for, because you may have found the wrong thing, what you search. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I wish I could uh, kind of uh, clean up my uh, either my disk storage or my brain storage. I, I like, guess they uh, got some advertisement for GenBrain. Anybody heard of that place or, the, or that product? Apparently, that's also what is responsible for Bill Gates' riches. I mean, a whole lot of people were being mentioned, including Bill Gates. And why they were so smart? That was because they're using or had been using this product called GenBrain, G E N B R A I N. I've never heard of it, and I think it's just a lot of garbage. But, <laughs> but anyway, I thought maybe somebody knew about this. Uh huh. Well, well certainly the medical guys are uh, big pharma is spending lots of money trying to figure out uh, new pills that they can sell old people to improve their brain. That's a big market because there are more old people every year. Yeah, well, in the next story, Richard, there is a, a way of doing things without spending money on big pharma, and that's by eating less. What's this about calorie restriction? Well, this is uh, going to save you money also, besides uh, extending your life, because you don't have to buy as much food. And, you know, they've known for a while that calorie restriction uh, can improve lifespan. And now they're studying it more carefully. And what they have found is that calorie restriction improves metabolic and immune responses that help determine how long you live and more importantly, how many years of good health that you will have. And what they have found is that two years of quote, modest calorie restriction, restriction programs the pathway in fat cells that help regulate the way mitochondria generate energy and this, they also benefit the body's anti-inflammatory responses, and they believe it will impact longevity. And this calorie restriction rewires many of the metabolic and immune responses that boost lifespan and health span. And what they're talking about here is the, in the study, people who cut their calorie intake by about 14 percent for a typical person that might be two or three hundred calories a day less than they're eating now uh, if they did this 14 percent calorie reduction over two years they generate more t cells which play a role in immune system and slow the aging this particular part of it happens because as people age, their thalamuses shrink 
and the thalamuses are what produce T cells and calorie restriction helps prevent the thalamus from shrinking so the person generates more T cells and this increase in T cells is also associated with an improved ability to burn uh, fatty acids for energy and this improved uh, burning of fatty acids then has impact on muscle and liver and it leads to uh, the problem leads to insulin resistance, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and aging. Uh, the third level that they found is these calorie restrictions also reduces the level of what of gene encoding platelet activating factor PLA G PLA two G seven and reducing PLA two G seven produces health benefits that include lowering age related inflammation and improving metabolic health. So uh, it sounds like that there are fairly significant benefits. All you have to do to achieve those benefits is cut 300 calories out of your diet for the next two years. Mm -hmm. And then not only will you be healthy and have more energy, you'll also be trim and slim and uh, all of those good things. So who wants to sign up for this? Any thoughts? Yeah, I eat one meal a day. And that means I'm way below that 300 uh, reduction. Absolutely. And it's good. I how don't long, suffer how, hunger more than a year. Okay. So yeah. you're halfway there. <laughs> Perhaps. But yeah, it's, it's a great program. Uh, you stay slim. Uh, you stay alert. You're not hungry. People just don't realize that, you know, uh, millennia ago, men and women were lucky to eat one meal a day. And yes. that's the way our bodies are, are, are built. Eating several times a day is crazy. Waste Keaton, time and money. Keaton, how long did it take you to phase in getting to one meal a day? Did you do uh, it all of a sudden or over time? Yeah. No, I, I just basically, I read about uh, what they call intermittent fasting. Yes. And so I started uh, just eliminating breakfast and lunch and eating once, you know, in the evening. Uh, now, I break the rule maybe once a week, just, you know, for social reasons. I'm joining somebody for lunch or for breakfast. But normally, one meal a day is just perfect. Uh, how many years past 100 and now you know? <laughs> I just wonder that if um, by exercising you can also reduce calories the same way. I wonder if that would work. So you might eat three times a day, but you exercise up to, uh, and maybe you know that, Keaton. But no, it's yeah. not the, the effect of, on calories of walking or other exercise is not that great. But I do walk a mile every morning. I was going to say to uh, exercise off 300 calories a day is a real significant amount of exercise. And I can't do it. No. Yeah, you can't lose weight with exercise. There's good uh, science behind that. But interestingly enough, in the blue zones of the world, they don't just eat one meal a day. So the blue zones of the world are where there's a disproportionate number of people who are over 100 years of age. And apparently there's a combination of factors, uh, respect for the elderly, community, um, often the elderly are part of a multi-generational family and their knowledge is really um, important. They've also had calorie restriction as young people and tremendous amounts of exercise. So it's high mountain regions in Italy, 
Um, there's one in the US and Japan is another of these blue regions, but I don't think you can just say calorie restriction. The other question I have about that study is what level were the people at to begin with when they were talking about restricting calories? I don't think you want Keaton to restrict another 300 calories a day, as he said. Right, quite so, quite so. <laughs> well, certainly I've been reading about uh, calorie restrictions for many, many years, and it started with studies that showed a 30% calorie reduction having uh, longevity benefits in rats, and it has gone from there. And I think I think there are two issues that people are often talking about. One is calorie restriction, and the other is reducing the amount of time in which you're eating. Sure. Um, and obviously what Keaton is doing is both. But there are, apparently are, are huge advantages to eating less frequently, as well as to eating less. And so he has a combination of things. Uh, but uh, some people get a lot of advantage from just eating less, even if they don't restrict their calories. But restricting their calories provides an additional thing, is I think what science is saying. Hmm. I'm wondering, Keaton, if the, what you eat should also be important. So that one meal you have a day, is that well balanced? Yes, that's very important. I, I don't eat pizza and junk food. I, I try to get... Uh, uh, proteins and uh, fiber. Uh, fiber is very important. Right. Do you never do anything about which you feel guilty? <laughs> I had blueberries with a half a scoop of vanilla ice cream last night <laughs> for dessert. The well, blueberries are good. good. Yeah, well, they're very healthy. It only set you back a month and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks a lot, Richard. Great discussion. And thanks to everybody for participating. And we'll see you next week. Bye for now. Okay. Yeah. Goodbye for now. Bye Goodbye for now. Hawaii. Good to see you all. And we'll see you next week. Next week.